Hey, Walter Sorrell's back with more tips for the knife maker. Except not today. Today, making a guitar amp cabinet. So, of course, I'll be back next week with another knife-related video, but every now and then I like to go on a sort of craft excursion and do something off the knife-making path. So picking up on last week's video about making a guitar amp from a kit, today I'll make a cabinet for a small combo amp, obviously putting all that electronics inside. If you like the way this works, you can use the same techniques to make a cab for basically any type of amp. It's really just about finding the dimensions that work for your amp. Now the amp that I'm making this cabinet for is a Gibson GA5 style 5 watt practice amp that I'm making from a kit by Mojo Tone. For the story of why I picked this particular amp to make and to watch the electronics being made, link in the cards and description. This is a very simple one knob amp. Here's a shot of the completed chassis. Now brief history of the GA5 then I'll shut up and start building. The GA5 was pretty much a Fender Champ clone when it was introduced by Gibson in the early 50s, and then it went through several iterations with different looks, different circuitry, before finally being discontinued in the late 60s. There were a variety of different cabinets, but the one that I'm aiming for is kind of a twist on the 1960-ish version, the Skylark model, which I owned when I was a kid. All right, the cab will be made from a tropical exotic wood called Bloodwood, which, as the name suggests, will cover your shop, your clothes, and your dog with an amazing amount of bright red dust. It also looks cool, which is really the only point of this build. Otherwise, I'd just buy the pre-made Mojo Tone cabinet. The amp has a depth of eight inches, so a sensible person would have bought eight inch lumber. I didn't. So here's how that went. After running the lumber through my planer to thin it down from four quarters, which as any woodworker knows doesn't equal one inch, to get it down to about three quarter inch stock, I hacked it into four pieces for the sides, bottom, and top using the world's highest quality homemade sled. As you can see, I splurged and used the finest material ever made, MDF, for its construction. Also, I ripped some two inch wide pieces to glue together to get the full depth I needed for the cab. Nothing too cute about the glue up. The only unusual thing is that I cleaned each face with acetone. The deal with oily tropical woods is that oil in the joints tends to compromise the glue. So if you can dissolve some of the oil and dry up the joint a little, the glue will stick better and you'll get a better joint. Other than that, it's just a simple matter of clamping them up, dropping them on the floor, swearing, cleaning them re-gluing and not dropping them the second time around. Once the joints were all glued up and I had full width boards, I used a dado blade on my table saw and a homemade jig on my sled to cut box joints for the corners. If you want to do a really fancy job of box joints, you calculate exactly the width of the lumber, shim up your dado to produce a width that will divide exactly into that width so as to produce perfectly consistent joint widths from one end to the other. I did not do that because math. Also because life's too short. You always want to do a test run to make sure that all your measurements and calculations translate into the real world, so I ran a couple of scraps through the jig and everything fit acceptably. You don't want to find out that you were a hair off in your jig setup so nothing fits. I won't go into tons of detail on the jig, but basically you just make a little finger that extends out from the rear face of the sled and fits the joint exactly. 
Then you jump it from cut to cut with that little finger holding your board in precise position to replicate the proper cut distance. You can see how it works, pretty simple. The face of the GA5 chassis, like lots of combo amps, is beveled slightly, in this case 30 degrees. So I measured everything, cut the two faces on my bandsaw, and then sawed the bevel into the cabinet top by setting my table saw at 30 degrees and ripping a new face. It also fits into a slot that needs to be sawed out before glue up. Now it's time to glue everything up. I glued both sides of each box joint using plenty of glue. This is very hard wood, so it doesn't crush easily. And that, in turn, meant that the joints were a little sticky toward the bottom. So, a certain amount of vigorous persuasion was required to get everything to full depth. I did a lot of checking with machinist squares to make sure everything was dead square as I assembled and glued it. I kept checking as I went because I didn't want anything starting to set up cockeyed before I'd finished the whole thing. Turned out I had plenty of time, but better safe than sorry. There are also a couple of back braces or tracks that will support a back piece, which I don't show in this video. So if you like what I do on this channel, I hope you'll support me on Patreon. 95% of what I do is about knife making, but every now and then I like to take a little detour and do something else that's fun to me, and I hope to my viewers. If you can get behind that, jump over to Patreon, where at any pledge level, you'll get plans for tons of my builds, along with the satisfaction of helping me bring more cool videos to you. All right, back to work. Then I sawed out the speaker cavity using my least favorite power tool of all time, the jigsaw. Maybe my jigsaw just sucks, but I only use this thing when there's virtually no other sane alternative. The original GA5 cab was made of pine. Some people believe that wood, and I have no reason to think they're wrong, that wood has a huge effect on the sonics of speaker cabinets. So I decided to make this baffle from pine. Yeah, right. Actually, I just didn't think spending a bunch of money on exotic wood that was going to be painted black and covered with plastic grill material made any sense. If there's an acoustic benefit, and there may well be, well, I'll take credit for that too. A little black spray paint. Then I added grill cloth to the baffle. Just cut it out, then stapled on the sides with a staple gun, then hammered the staples down to get them nice and flush so it would fit cleanly into the cab. Maybe there's a trick to this, but I really had trouble getting it tight enough. It seemed like after I finished stapling, the plastic stretched a little. Not a horrible result, but not as tight as I would have liked. Maybe you can use a heat gun or something to shrink it up, but anyway, it came out fine. Now, some preliminary sanding to clean up all the joints. Uh... 
I also rounded the corners. Using 60 grit sandpaper, you can just bust off those corners pretty quickly with an orbital sander. I was considering doing it with a roundover bit on a router, but that's really pretty easy to screw up. Sometimes you get tear out. It's a little bit of a pain to set it up. Anyway, doing it with the sander worked out just fine and I got a nice clean roundover. Then it was time for more sanding. A little more softening of the corners. I went to 120 grit, then 220, then up to 320, then 600. After that, I applied a brush-on water-based polyurethane finish. This deepens the color a little and gives a modest amount of protection for all the banging that all amps are prone to. Next, in goes the speaker baffle. The speaker in the original Skylark, the 1960-ish one I'm copying anyway, is mounted on a slightly upward cant, so I glued and screwed some little braces for mounting them. And then the baffles screwed and glued to those. If you're planning to do something similar to this, but for a different model of amplifier, the key thing you have to do in advance is to make sure you don't have any interference between the chassis and the speaker. If the speaker bumps into the chassis or the chassis can't insert correctly, you're in big trouble. Once the glue's dry, the speaker is screwed into the baffle. Finally, I slide the chassis in, drill a couple pilot holes, then tighten the mounting screws. The last touch is to add a handle and feet. The handle hardware has a little stud that acts as a keeper for the leather handle. A hole has to be rebated into the wood so the stud can fit. A few more pilot holes, then the handle hardware is screwed on. four holes for the feet, more screws and the rubber feet are now functional. So I'm pretty happy with the outcome here. I've done box joints in the past and each time I make them I do a little bit better job. Still not 100% delirious about the joints but they're not terrible. Alright guys, thanks for watching and next week it's back to knife making. watching guys if you like what we're doing here please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos want to buy a knife from me check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com digging the channel you can support our video making efforts on patreon you know i've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years so i hope you'll show some love for all that hard work link in the cards and descriptions 
Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. WalterSorrelsBlades.com